My name is Laurel Breitman, and this is my book, Animal Madness, How Anxious Dogs, Compulsive Parrots, and Elephants in Therapy Help Us Understand Ourselves. And I'm going to read you a little bit from the first chapter. This is actually the end of the first chapter, and it's about my own dog, who's a Bernese mountain dog named Oliver, and he became extremely unhinged over the course of um, my first six months with him. And this little excerpt is from the end where I'm talking about how things ended with him, but I'm not giving much away because, well, I'm just not. Despite our efforts to help him, Oliver's anxiety at being left alone only increased in the years he lived with us. His storm phobia reduced him to a shaking, inconsolable mess, and it took him hours, sometimes days, to recover. He continued to eat things that weren't food if we left him alone past 5 p.m., and with every passing night, he seemed to hunt for invisible flies for longer periods of time. Whenever Oliver was agitated, which was often, he gnawed things in the apartment. He also became more aggressive at the dog park and snapped at a few young children. We were tired, and by we, I mean me and my ex-husband. By that, uh, he was an ex at the time. <laughs> by that time, Jude and I had tried virtually every means of therapy and treatment available to American pet owners. We'd ha taken him to a veterinary behaviorist, given him first Valium, then Prozac, then both. We practiced behavioral modification and training in an attempt to manage his anxiety. We played him recorded sounds of storms to desensitize him to thunder, and jingled our keys even when we weren't planning on leaving the house. We took him on long walks, then long hikes. We tried to socialize him with other dogs. We gave him toys and treats. We gave him affection. We thought about getting him another animal companion and then decided against it. We tried and failed to give him certainty. When we left Oliver at the kennel that December, Jude and I planned to be away for less than a week. My family in California are farmers, and one afternoon, less than three days into our trip, Jude, my mom, and I walked to the very top of the hill behind the house. We stood at the property line where rusted barbed wire dipped between the posts like bunting and lemon orchards spread out beneath us. My cell phone rang, and then Jude's. I don't remember who picked up first, but I remember what we were told. You're going to have to act fast. We're not sure if he's going to make it. It happened so quickly. We are so sorry. No, we don't know why. Oliver had worked himself into a panic after his afternoon walk, and began to anxiously chew on a piece of wood on the door in his dog run. By the time someone noticed what he was doing, it was too late. It couldn't have been going on for more than a half hour, the manager of the kennel told me, but he was panting and making wheezing sounds, and then I noticed how he was standing. Oliver was suffering from bloat. This horrid and probably excruciatingly painful predicament comes about when a dog's stomach fills with air, fluid, or food, and twists, putting pressure on other internal organs and possibly cutting off their blood supply. You have about 45 minutes to perform surgery and untwist the stomach before there's irreparable damage. Bloat is notorious for affecting deep, barrel-chested dogs like Bernese Mountain Dogs, St. Bernard's, and Basset Hounds. There's no single thing that brings it on, and I couldn't find any research linking anxiety blo to bloat, but I believe that's what happened in Oliver's case. He was in a frenzy. He was gulping air and chunks of wood. He was agitated and scared. He was alone. When we reached the attending vet on the phone, she told us that Oliver was in the operating room. They had opened him up as soon as he arrived and unwound his twisted intestines, tacked them aside, and surveyed the damage. She said that it was bad, and she couldn't guarantee that further surgery would help him. She also said that if we went ahead and performed the surgery, we were looking at expenses, including the procedures they'd already done, of between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. You might want to think this over, she said to Jude, but don't think for long, because we can't keep him here on the operating table. I looked at the neat geometry of tree rows below us and began to cry. I thought of Oliver's soft body on the steel table, his flanks splayed open, his heavy, unknowing head. Jude put his arms around me and said something, but I don't know what it was. I heard only the blood in my ears and felt a sudden, thudding grief. We called the veterinarian back and told her to put Oliver down. She assured us that he wouldn't feel any pain, that he was already unconscious. I made her promise that she would cradle his head and stroke him while he died, that she would call him Beast and tell him that we loved him. And then I asked lamely, do you think we're bad people? I was remembering the story of a friend's friend in veterinary school who treated a Labrador for extensive injuries after he was hit by a car. The family who brought the dog in loved him but couldn't afford the recommended surgeries and decided to put him down. The vets didn't knew that the dog would survive if the costly treatment was done. She let the family say goodbye to him and then, after they'd left the clinic, she treated the dog and adopted him herself. 
I found this story chilling. It was good, after all, that the dog had survived. But shouldn't she have offered to do the work for free and send the dog home with his family? As we waited for the vet to call us back and tell us when it was over, I had visions of Oliver bounding out of the hospital with other richer people, or with a soft-spoken lady veterinarian. I thought of him turning around, scanning the sidewalk for us, and then getting into someone else's car. No, the vet said to us, I understand. There's a greeting card that I found in the gift shop of the Sigmund Freud Museum in London, and keep tacked above my desk next to a drawing of a squirrel in a t-shirt shooting heroin. The card is black with bright yellow type, and reads, Blessed are the cracked, for they let in the light. Supposedly Groucho Marx said it, though I can't find proof. If he did say it, he probably wasn't referring to neurotic dogs, but he could have been. Oliver died more than six years ago now, and when I think about him, I ache. I bet Jude does too, but we don't talk about things like that anymore. We don't talk much at all, actually. We divorced the year after Oliver died, and a few years after that, he stopped taking my calls. I can't say that we broke up because of what happened with Oliver. That would be a lie, or at least it wouldn't be the whole truth. I do believe, however, that if Oliver had lived, we may not have broken up when we did. Dogs have a way of gluing people together, even ones who are already clemming unglued. Now it feels like I walk around with a few different drafty spaces in my chest. One is in the shape of a dog, and there's at least one more in the shape of a man. And yet, in the years since Oliver died, I've fallen in love again anyway, with a dozen elephants, a few elephant seals, a troop of gorillas, one young whale, a couple of long dead squirrels, and a handful of men and women who came into my life as if they'd been tugged there by invisible leashes. I'm not sure I would have found any of these creatures otherwise. Losses and disappointment can do that if you're lucky. Before you know it, your pain has welcomed the world. That's what happened to me anyway. One anxious dog brought me the entire animal kingdom. I owe him everything. Thank you. It's going to be hard to get B-roll of the book.